In this lecture, I'm going to be taking you through the role of the criminal justice system. We're going to outline what the criminal justice system is, the different agencies involved, the government departments, what they do, what their role is, and how this all links together with the idea of crime control and prevention and punishment. Now, you won't be asked directly about the criminal justice system in the exam. You won't be asked to kind of outline and explain to or anything like that. But it's important that you do understand the criminal justice system as it does play an important role in crime control and prevention and punishment. So let's first look at the core agencies of the criminal justice system. Now, as I said, this is the UK criminal justice system, um, but there are slight variations in Northern Ireland, um, Wales and Scotland. But this is the kind of core um, process and the core um, agencies that are involved. The first one we're going to look at is the police and they are basically your first interaction with the criminal justice system. They're the ones who will be called out when there is a when a crime has occurred. They're the ones who do they investigate. They also do their own triage if you remember where they determine whether a case is worth investigating or whether it's too minor and they can do cautions and warnings but they're kind of your first interaction with the criminal justice system and um, they're not judge dread so they can't do judge jury and executioner but they do gather the evidence that they're, they're the ones who they're the investigative branch if you like because they're the ones who determine if it's a crime that's worth investigating thinking about the the, the triage that we talked about um, previously but they're also the ones who um, ensure that the evidence that is collected can be used in court. So they'll interview suspects, they'll arrest people. They're the ones who, who basically get the case together. And after that, that then gets passed on to the Crown Prosecution Service. Now, the Crown CPS and the police do work hand in hand together because the police once they've got their investigation together, they've arrested somebody, um, they've got their evidence and all of that, they will pass that on to the Crown Prosecution Service, who will then determine if there is enough evidence to take the case to court. So one of the key roles of the Crown Prosecution Service is to determine which cases go to court and which don't. So they have a kind of two prong uh, approach to this the first thing they will look at is the evidence and if there is enough evidence to have a high probability of conviction now, the crown prosecution service is a government agency so that does mean that they have a budget and court cases are not cheap a crown court costs three just over three thousand pounds per day and that's just for the room that doesn't include the judges or the lawyers or any of the other people that are involved in the case. And most cases don't take a single day. They can take weeks and in some cases months. Um, so the Crown Prosecution Service will look at the evidence gathered by the police and determine whether or not it is a case they could win and get a guilty conviction in a court. Um, situation or not um, but what they'll also do is determine whether or not it is a case worth taking to court so there are some cases where they will say that the, there's no that it's not in the public interest to prosecute this case for example the um, law regarding age of consent in the UK under the law if you are under 16 and you engage in sexual activity consensually, because obviously non-consensually is a, is a different matter entirely, but consensually, you can be prosecuted and um, receive a sentence of up to five years in a youth offenders institution. Now, this law is not enacted, it, it's not prosecuted because it's not seen as in the public interest to prosecute a 14 or 15 year old for having sex. Instead, it will be passed on to other government agencies for support, education um, and monitoring. So one of the things the Crown Prosecution Service does is weigh up if it's worth 
or if it's in the public interest to prosecute a case. Um, but they are the lawyers who are in court and they are the prosecution. So they're the ones who are trying to prove guilt and they work for the government. That's why it's called the Crown. So when you have a criminal case, it's the Crown versus whoever it is who's the defendant. And their job is to prove guilt. They're the, what, they're, it's their job to ensure that the guilty are found guilty and punished for their crimes. Now, what they might do is rather than take a case to court, if then there's a good probability that they'll win the case, but not an excellent one. What they might do is offer what's known as a plea deal. And what that means is that the um, Crown Prosecution Service will tell the defendant that if they plead guilty to a crime, uh, maybe a lesser crime than the one that they're being um, charged with, then they'll get a, a reduced sentence. And that bypasses the whole court case situation because the defendant has said, yeah, I'm guilty and goes straight to sentencing. So it's still seen in a courtroom, but it's not to determine guilt or innocence, it's to determine sentencing. Um, and the Crown Prosecution Service's job is to ensure the safety of everybody in the UK by prosecuting and um, determining the guilt of criminals. They don't determine the sentencing, they just present the cases. Now, what they can do in terms of sentences is they can present mitigating or aggravating circumstances. Now, usually it's aggravating. So the, what that means is, is they tell the court during sentencing of why this person should receive a harsher sentence than, um, or what other factors are involved in ensuring that this person gets the, the, the appropriate sentence. The defence will normally put forward mitigating circumstances in sense that they will put forward reasons why perhaps then the, the um, defendant um, shouldn't be um, judged too harshly. Maybe there's abuse in their background, they, they were under the influence of alcohol, which can be both mitigating and aggravating. Um, maybe they've got um, special educational needs or learning difficulties, which means they maybe perhaps didn't quite understand the consequences of their actions, things like that, which will kind of lessen the, blo the, the sentence, if you like. So after the Crown Prosecution Service, we've then got the court system in the UK. So this is where the cases are tried. Now, as I said, when um, a person is arrested, they have what's called a um, summary judgment and they will go to a magistrate's court, which is the lowest court we have in the UK, and they will be asked um, if they are guilty or innocent to, to enter a plea. And when they enter the plea, if they enter a plea of guilty, then they skip straight to the sentencing phase. If they plead innocent, that's when you get a court case. And depending on the offence, depends on whether the um, case is heard in a magistrate's court or in a crown court. So the lesser sentence, the lesser serious crimes, what are called summary offences, where a person is not entitled to a trial by jury. So things like motoring offences or common assault where there's no serious injury, shoplifting, things like that would be heard as a summary offence in the magistrate's court. Um, whereas um, indictable offences, which are the serious offences, rape, murder, assault with, serious, with a deadly weapon, things like that, they would be heard in um, a crown court because they're more serious and you do have a right to trial by jury. Now, if we focus in on the, the magistrates courts, 95% of cases are handled by magistrates courts. And a magistrates court is headed by either two to three magistrates who are lay people, they're not lawyers, 
they're usually local volunteers who have some training but it doesn't have, they don't have to have law degrees or anything like that and they are assisted by um legal clerks who kind of explain the law and, and things to them or you can have a district judge and a district judge is a lawyer they are legally trained um and they sit on the bench on their own as i said 95 percent of cases are handled in a magistrate's court and um there are cases which are known as either way offenses so these are more serious offenses than summary ones but not quite as bad as indictable and what the things like theft handling stolen goods and things like that and because the magistrate's court is limited in the sentencing that they can give what they can do is after they've heard the case if they believe that they are unable to give a sufficient punishment they can pass the sentencing off to the crown court the guilty verdict still stands it's just the sentencing that is done by the crown court so a magistrate's court can sentence up to six months in prison a fine of up to five thousand pounds or community service or um, the electronic tagging the the house arrest type thing so if they believe that the offense that has been um, committed and been the person has been found guilty of requires more than that as a punishment they will pass the case on to the crown court for for sentencing what the magistrates court also does is even with the indictable offenses they will start in a magistrates court so you'll have the um the the regarding the guilty not guilty plea from the defendant but the law the magistrates court will also decide if the defendant gets bail or remand so if you get bail that means that you are putting somebody is putting forward a certain amount of money usually quite a lot um to say that they are responsible for you until you get to court they will make sure that you don't commit another offence that you don't run away and that you actually turn up in court and if you don't then the person that's put up your bail loses that money now no money actually changes hands at the at the start it's a it's a case of showing that you have the funds to be able to cover the bail and only when the if the bail is breached it then the money is taken they also the magistrate court also determines reporting restrictions and what that means is they determine whether or not the defendant or the victim's names can be released to the press whether it will be an open court where people can sit in the public gallery or closed whether the um, case can be videoed or photographs can be taken or whether it, there will be a court artist who will draw pictures so they're, they're the ones who it's the magistrate's court who determine those restrictions so when it is an indictable offence and it goes to the next level it's a crown court and here is where you would have a judge and jury now not every case will have a jury but you are if you go if your case is heard in a crown court then you are entitled to a jury that doesn't apply to sentencing because a jury is not involved in sentencing that's the judge the only the judges involved in sentencing so when you go to a crown court for a um trial you are entitled to a jury and um, they are the ones who will determine your guilt or innocence based on the evidence presented and then the judge will be able to then determine your sentencing um, again there will be a sentencing hearing to um, determine mitigating and aggravating circumstances the judge will then take make their decision and um they can they are restricted in terms of the legal guidelines as to what they can um sentence you to there are maximum sentences but we don't have mandatory minimums so they can do prison sentences fines they can say time served so if you were kept on remand during uh, while awaiting trial and you're still found guilty they can say well actually you've already spent two years in prison so we're going to say you've already served your prison sentence okay 
Um, now, if you are unhappy with your case at Crown Court or Magistrate Court level, you can go to the appeals court system. So you would make or your lawyers would make an application to the appeals court to say my case was unfair because certain evidence wasn't um, presented or I didn't get the best defence or um, new evidence has come to light, things like that that, that would then warrant a new trial or you can go to the appeal court and say that your sentence perhaps you feel your sentence was too harsh and you think that perhaps yes you are guilty but the judge went a bit too far in terms of sentences and you can appeal your sentence and the appeal court will look at the evidence they will review your case and determine whether or not there should be an appeals case so if it's a case that your trial was unfair and you, you maintain your innocence, but you've been found guilty, the appeals court can grant a new trial. But there has to be new evidence unless there was proof of the trial being unfair in some way. If it's down to sentencing, that goes to the attorney general for um, review. If you're still unhappy after you've been through the appeals court system, you can apply to the Supreme Court which is essentially the House of Lords. And there are a number of law lords who are ex-judges who sit on a panel and review cases. And again, they will say whether or not they believe that a case is worth um, reviewing, whether it needs a new trial, whether the sentencing was unfair. Um, and if they say, yes, there is um, a case here, they will then take that back to the courts if they don't believe it's the case unfortunately now that we're not in the eu we don't have another step it used to be that you would take it to, you could take it to the european courts but unfortunately that's not an option anymore so that, that's the third agency of the criminal justice system is the court system so after you've been to court and if you've been found innocent brilliant off you go you're um, interaction with the criminal justice system has now ended. However, if you're found guilty, you are then passed on to the National Offender Management Service, NOMS. And NOMS are the people who deal with prisons and probation, um, community service, all of those things, that all those sentences that can be um, given by the court system it's the National Offender Management Service who basically they enact the um, punishment. So they oversee the prisons and um, processes within prisons, such as rehabilitation programs and drug rehabilitation, um, therapy, education, training, things like that. Um, and they also work with the probation service to try and prevent reoffending after you've been released from prison so making sure that you um, they're the ones who manage the probation offices where you would go to register weekly to meet with your probation officer or you'd have to go if you got into yourself into trouble and things like that within that you also have the youth justice board so this is the the team that oversees the youth offenders so these are the under um, 18 offenders now in the uk if you are prosecuted as a juvenile, as a youth, you cannot be held as an adult. So when you, in certain cases, so say you were um, 14 or 15, when you go to the magistrate's court to um, put in your plea, um, the Crown Prosecution Service will have to say whether they are prosecuting you as a child, as a youth, or whether they're going to try and prosecute you as an adult and that will then require um, psychological assessments and the Crown Prosecution Service will have to um, explain why they want to prosecute you as an adult rather than as a juvenile but if you are tri tried as a juvenile at 18 you will be released because you cannot be held as an adult for a crime you committed as a child if you are prosecuted as an adult when you are 14 or 15 and you are found guilty, you will spend the first part of your sentence 
in a youth offenders institution overseen by the Youth Justice Board. And at 18, 19, um, you would be moved to an adult prison, um, depending on how long your sentence was, obviously. But the Youth Offenders Board um, oversees the youth detention centres, the uh, juvenile detention centres, the education system that is uh, provided within the youth justice, uh, within the youth offenders institutions, because you're still of school age and you still re are required to have an education, so you will still have lessons and things like that. But all of these agencies will work together to put forward a case to ensure that justice is served, whether that be a guilty or an innocent verdict. If we move on then, above the core agencies, you've got the government departments which oversee the criminal justice system. So there are three government departments who are the overseers of the criminal justice system and they kind of overlap. They're, they're not just um, in, in charge of one specific thing. Because the criminal justice system is quite interwoven, it's more of a Venn diagram than separate boxes, these agencies, these government departments have to work together to ensure that there is a consistent approach and that all agencies are doing their jobs properly. So the first agency is the attorney, uh, sorry, department is the attorney general. So this is the top lawyer in the UK. They are the um, the boss of all the Crown Prosecution Service. So they oversee the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, they are in charge of serious fraud office, revenue and customs, prosecutions. And the Attorney General is an individual, um, but obviously has a team of people that they work with because they can't do it all on their own. But their responsibility is to ensure that the rule of law is upheld. They are the ones who the the um, a, the de department which ensures that trials are fair, that um, sentences are within guidelines, that nobody's getting too lenient a sentence, nobody's getting too harsh a sentence, and that's why the attorney general is the one who takes action when an unduly lenient sentence is being um, appealed um, or if a uh, sentence is de deemed to be too harsh. Um, but they also deal with um, proceedings under the Contempt of Court Act. And what that is, is if somebody behaves in a way that is not appropriate in a court, um, perjury, um, where you lie under oath, um, where you perhaps um, say or do things that the judge to, says is inappropriate, uh, badgering a witness if you're a lawyer. So anyone can be in contempt of court, be it lawyer, prosecution, defence, um, witnesses who refuse to um, give testimony. We don't have the Fifth Amendment. We cannot say that we we don't we we have the right to say nothing. We don't have that in the UK. So if you refuse once you're sworn in to say anything, you can be held in contempt of court. Um, it can also apply to um, people in the public gallery. If people in the public gallery don't behave themselves appropriately, they can be held in contempt of court. And it's the Attorney General's office who oversee that process. And they work alongside the Home Office. So these are the people, the uh, department um, who are headed by the Home Secretary and are in charge of the police. So they are the people who ensure that the police are doing their jobs properly. They're the ones, when we were talking about institutional racism, they're the ones who um, instigated the McPherson report and all of that side of things. Um, their job is also to, to, to do with uh, anti-terror, processes, um, antisocial behaviour and all and um, ensuring the safety of the public. That is their role, is to ensure the safety of the public. 
Um, so they're also the ones who are responsible for any crime prevention or reduction policies and counterterrorism and all of that. So they would be the ones who would enact the situational crime prevention or environmental crime prevention, all of those things, extra surveillance. They are the department who would um, put those policies, put those strategies into place. The final element is, oh, the final department is the Ministry of Justice. And this is really to do with the court system and the prisons and the um, National Offenders Management Service. So they're the ones who ensure that the criminal justice system from beginning to end is um, done appropriately, it is managed effectively. Um, they're the ones who are responsible for interpreting criminal law to make sure that the laws are being um, enacted as intended. Um, they're the ones who review sentencing policy and the um, mandatory, uh, sorry, maximum sentences. We don't have mandatory minimums, uh, the maximum sentences. They're also the department that provides legal aid. So they're the ones who provide lawyers for defendants who can't afford them. Um, and they work with prisons on reoffending, um, reducing reoffending through rehabilitation programs and things like that. So as you can see, these three age, uh, government departments don't work in isolation. They work together to ensure a consistent message and consistent approach to enacting um, the law, protecting the public and ensuring the criminal justice system is as fair and as um, consistent as possible across the UK. So what is the role of crime, criminal justice system and crime control and prevention? That's what sociologists are really interested in. And they've identified four um, roles that the criminal justice system plays. The first is the role of deterrence. So they, because they're, put, they're the ones who determine the prison, the, the punishments, the, the sentencing of crimes, they are the what they can use that as a deterrence to um, criminal activity. If you're going to break the law, we can do this to you. We can put you in prison for X number of years. We can take away your assets, which means any monies or um, uh, financial uh, material goods that you have, they can take it away from you if it's determined that those material items were achieved or bought through illegal gain. So the, the role they play is as an act of deterrence. Don't break the law because this is what we will do. They also um, have the role of public protection to ensure that those who are a danger to society are removed from that society by prison, psychiatric prisons, um, or whatever, um, uh, including um, deportation of criminals. So th they, their role, the crim criminal justice system is about protecting the public. And by protecting the public, they're reducing criminal activity. We also talk about rehabilitation. So a big part of the criminal justice system is to prevent reoffending then we know that crime is inevitable in society. We, we've talked about that. We, we've, we've discussed why crime is inevitable. So what the criminal justice system wants to do is not get rid of crime because that's not possible, but to reduce it by preventing reoffending. So you've done something horrible. Um, you've committed a crime. You've served your punishment for it. What the criminal justice system is trying to do is stop you doing it again. Um, by education programs, apprenticeships, skills, uh, therapy, rehabilitation in terms of drugs and alcohol and addiction, um, all of those causes of crime that we've looked at previously, they try to deal with them or try to alleviate some of those pressures by offering these um, rehabilitation programs. And the final role of the criminal justice system is retribution. 
And that sounds really harsh, but what they mean by that is giving the victims a sense of justice, giving them the feeling that their victimization has been dealt with, that they have been um, vindicated in their victimization, that they, they are not to blame, they were the victim and something has been done about it whether that be a prison sentence, um, a fine, community service, a criminal record, but they have been um, identified as being the victim, they have been vindicated and they have had justice and the criminal justice system ensures that the victims or tries to ensure that the victims get that. So let's bring back to the sociology, the sociological perspectives and their views on the criminal justice system. So we're only really going to be looking at the structural approaches here because the interactionist approach is obviously a, a micro level and the criminal justice system is a government institution, it is a societal institution. So postmodernists and interactionists aren't really that interested in the structure of the criminal justice system. They might be more interested in how individuals are um, treated or how individuals experience the criminal justice system, but not the, the, the CJS as, as a whole. So if we look at the functionalists, as you can imagine, the functionalists are happy, clappy hippies, see the criminal justice system as a vital institution within society. It works alongside other social institutions, such as education and the media, um, and the government to ensure social solidarity and cohesion by maintaining law and order. So for the functionalists, they see the criminal justice system as a benefit to society, as a cornerstone of society in order to maintain social cohesion and social solidarity. The Marxists, on the other hand, um, see take a quite negative view of the criminal justice system and actually see it as part of the repressive state apparatus they see it as a system of social control and a way of the ruling class maintaining their power through the hidden oppression of the working class by making it look like the oppression is legitimate um, by look, making it look like the, the law is equal to everybody when it's not, and um, that it's for the betterment of everybody in society, not just the ruling class. So the Marxists do take quite a negative view of the criminal justice system because they see it as being run by the um, ruling class for the ruling class in order to maintain false class consciousness and to prevent revolution. The feminists are also quite negative about the criminal justice system and they see it as a tool of patriarchy and a way of men maintaining their power over women. And they point out that the criminal justice system is still majority male. It is That is changing. There are more women in the criminal justice system now than there were previously. However, um, the there is still a higher percentage of men within the criminal justice system than women. But what they also point out is that women face um, more discrimination by the criminal justice system through double deviancy, which we talked about previously when we did gender and crime, um, double deviancy being pointed out by Walklate, where um, women are, if, if they are a victim uh, sorry, if they're a perpetrator of a crime that also breaks not just the law, but gender roles, women will be treated more harshly in, by the criminal justice system. And they also talk about double, um, Walter also talks about double victimization, where women who are victims of crime are treated poorly by the criminal justice system by um, asking them how, by making them feel like they are at fault for their victimization and this is particularly in the case of sex crimes where they will be asked things like what were you wearing what did you say where, why were you there how much did you have to drink so putting the blame for the victimization back onto women so that they see that this is a way that women are 
um, oppressed and um, controlled by the criminal justice system for the benefit of men. Now, as I said, the um, you won't necessarily be asked a question directly on the criminal justice system or elements of the criminal justice system. You could be asked about um, perspectives, views. You could bring this into um, a theory and methods question, but um, you do need to understand the criminal justice system in order to be able to link it back to um, crime control and prevention or punishments.